Good morning, church. It's good to see you. Appreciate you being here this morning. Trent is uh, gone today. He's out doing some of that hard uh, work in Colorado, he told me. You know, his brother is getting married. He's doing the ceremony out there. And so uh, not only did he go to a nice, cool area uh, and leave me, but he left me the hard part of the text to preach too. So, uh, uh, but uh, please remember him and Kirsten as they're traveling for safety. Also, as we already mentioned, our Dominican uh, group too. I was watching a TV show yesterday. It's one of those, uh, I, I don't know the, the name, but one of those where they tear down the house, you know, and rebuild it and make it great. And I, I, at the beginning of that thing, I thought, now that, you know, they had a big sledgehammer there. They're knocking down walls. They're tearing out stuff. I thought, now that sounds, that looks fun. I could do that part. I could knock it out. I could tear it up. I could destroy it. But now, I, I, to build it back into something, that I have no skill for at all. You know, I mean, you're going to need somebody like Josh or some of these other guys that know how to build and put things together because I can do I can do the destruction, but I can't do the building. Well, it's kind of like that uh, with our own lives sometimes, you know, the destruction that we've brought on ourselves with sin, and, and yet God ha has given us a way through the gospel to rebuild something brand new and fresh. And, look. and so you've got these Christians uh, in uh, 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 that uh, Peter is writing to in the book of Second Peter, when our series, this series called "Faithful to the Finish," that they've been rebuilt. They've had, they've got a brand new lease on life here. They've started all over because of the gospel, and yet all of a sudden there's some things that are tough in their life. There's persecution that's happening from the outside. There's some hardship that's going on, and then you've got these folks that are coming in, slipping in among the church teaching things contrary to what they've been taught about the gospel. Now, you remember in chapter 1, he reminds, Peter reminds a bunch of folks, he said, look, you've got some precious promises that God's given you, and God's going to take care of you. But you do need to grow. You need to add to your faith, and he lists all those things that we talked about. And so you grow in your knowledge and in your salvation and in your confidence of what the Lord's done for you. But not only that, you grow in your knowledge of the Word, and he says, look, this Word we have came from God. It came by the Holy Spirit. Uh, it wasn't made up, Peter said. It, came, it did not have its origin with men. It came straight from God. And so you've got to follow it. And I'll tell you, he tells them, stay with the book. And I think that's good advice today. Stay with the book, don't you? That's pretty good advice. And so he tells them that, and then all of a sudden he gets into chapter 2, and these false teachers he talks about. But they're coming your way, and they're going to cause some, some destruction in your life if you're not careful. So you've got to beware of them, and he's going to give some warnings. And that takes us to the text here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, the last part of verse 3. He says this, Their condemnation, you already know there's going to be some bad news coming here for long. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. It, you might think it has. It might look, take longer than you think, but God's aware. Now, before I read this next verse, verse 4 through 9 is all one sentence in the original language. It's one sentence. It's a, if these things happen, then this takes place. That's all one sentence. And here it is. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell. Now, by this isn't the hell. This isn't the Gehenna hell. This is Tartus. This is a different word for it. But it's a word where there's punishment waiting for judgment to take place. Sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard. If this is so, then 
The Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. Father in heaven, we pray for a good understanding of your word. We pray, Father, for the raising up of godly men who follow you. We pray, Father, for a commitment to be faithful to you, faithful to your word, to your son, and to the cause that he left us with to reach people. Pray, Father, that you bless us today as we examine these words that you left. In Jesus' name, amen. This story starts out pretty bad. There's some destruction taking place. And what he tells us right off the bat, that the destruction of the ungodly is a sure thing. It is going to happen. There's no guesswork about this. It's going to take place. And he gives these examples. He said, look, if he condemned the angels when they sinned, hey, then he's going to condemn ungodly again. If he condemned the ancient world, remember in those days of Noah, let's just, let's just flip over there and just get a little, just a glimpse of that ancient world in Genesis chapter 5. Remember right before the flood, in verse, uh, Genesis 6 verse 5, the Bible says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. And in verse 11, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. So during this day, he says, Every inclination of the thoughts of their heart. Now think about that. You know what it means to incline, right? We know what it means to recline. You sit in your recliner, you pull the stick, and you, you lean back in comfort, right? He says it's to incline is to lean towards something. So he says every inclination, every inclination of the thoughts of their heart were evil. That's the only way they thought. You got it? That's how bad it was. It, was, it wasn't this that there was a little bit of unfaithfulness going on. It wasn't just that some were ungodly and some were God. Every inclination of the thoughts of their heart. And it pained God's heart when he saw that. And he finally said, I've had enough. And he brings the flood to destroy the ancient world. And I can't imagine what it was like after that door was closed to hear the cries of humanity as they were destroyed because of ungodliness. Then he says, as an example, here's Sodom and Gomorrah. Two cities that also stand to be destroyed. In Genesis chapter 19, remember this story. Two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called Lot. Where are the men who came to you? Tonight, bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you would like with them. But don't do anything to these men for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way. By the way, that's a familiar statement that a lot of people are saying today. Just get out of our way. Let us have it. They replied and they asked, This fella came here as an alien and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness. 
so that they could not find the door. That's how evil and corrupt the cities were. You got it? There's so much ungodliness here that's going on in their culture and their time and their cities that God said among those cities, I've had enough. You remember earlier, there was a bargaining to take place. Lord, if you could just find 40, 50 men righteous, would you hold back your judgment? Oh, yeah. How about 45? Yeah, if you can find 40. How about 40? How about 30? Finally, how about 10? If we could just find 10 righteous, God said, I'd hold it back. They couldn't even find 10. Now, I'm not saying our own culture and our own, our own situation has gotten to that point yet. But I'm telling you right now, we are headed in that direction. Make no doubt about it. When ungodliness is ruling people's hearts and minds and their inclination is to do evil, we're setting up the same situation as in the ancient world and also as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm telling you, make sure of it, God will destroy the ungodly. Now when false teachers come through, God always has something for those that would pull other people away from Him. Remember Jesus said, hey, don't you dare take these children in a different direction than they should go. He's got a judgment for that. Mary James said, don't many of you be teachers. They'll suffer the greater judgment. God's going to judge those that take away, that lead people away from him. It will happen. God will judge the ungodly. Well, who else then? Anybody, all of us that would act that way will receive that same judgment. And all the distress that it caused. Remember in Lot? In these verses, it says that he was distressed by the filthy lives of the lawless. The distress caused by culture is sickening. When Planned Parenthood will take the organs of a, of a baby that's aborted and sell them, and talk about it plainly as if that is not a human being. Don't tell me that's not ungodly. And somebody will pay the price for that. I'm telling you, we live in a culture that's headed down that direction. And it should sicken us. It should distress us. And if we get so used to it that we, we don't carry any shame anymore or any care anymore or it doesn't move our hearts, then we're headed in the wrong direction. We ought to always be bothered by that extreme ungodliness that exists in our culture and stand up for what is right. I hate it. I hate it. I'm like the, 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 like the prophet of old. I beg for the repentance of our country and our culture and our nation. I want God to bring about revival. I want great things to happen. But it's distressing. And it should be. But I'll tell you what the good news is. And in verse 9 he says, God knows how to rescue and deliver godly people. Boy, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that amongst all these examples of judgment that there's hope among those that are faithful to God. God knows how to rescue. God knows how to punish. And he won't mess up. You see, the ungodly will not be spared. The godly will be delivered. You've got the ungodly and the godly, and I say, pick a side, and don't be stupid. Which one you want to get on? Because you see, the one thing about the ungodliness happening in our culture and in our nation now is that it's going to force Christians to, to stand up stronger than they've ever stood before. It's time you make a decision. You get on God's side or not, but I'll tell you what, it's time for the divide to take place. And not, we got too many mega churches with unconverted believers, and so now it's time for you to get on board with the gospel or you get on board with ungodliness, but you're not going to sit on that line any longer. Make a choice. Pick a side. I'm going with the godly one part. 
Now, I am so grateful that God knows how to deliver. Because he delivered me from my own ungodliness. Understand, church, we're no better than those that will be condemned. We've just found our way by the cross to be saved by the grace of God. So our, our actions toward other people around us and our neighbors and our culture is one of love and it's one of begging for the souls of God wants to use you to beg for the souls of men. He's chosen the church to take the gospel to the world. You make a difference in the lives of people. So the old verse out of 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is true. Far and If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And what else? Turn, turn from their wickedness. Then God will bless and heal their land. So I'm praying and I want you to pray for revival among our nation. I want you to pray for the souls of lost. I want you to pray for opportunities. I want you to pray for God to turn around our nation. And, and have godly men once again look to him for guidance and wisdom. For righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, the wise men said. What are we going to take home out of this? I want you to go home with the determination of Noah. Do you realize 120 years he preached? Don't tell me God's not patient. 120 years preaching without a response. Now, if I go that long without a response, I'd probably get fired, you know. I mean, can you imagine his gospel meeting? It's him and his family, and then nobody else showing up, right? That many years, on and on and on. And yet, by faith, Hebrew writer says, Noah will say, it's because he put his faith and trust in God. And he and his family were rescued. God knows how to rescue the godly. And he will. Have a determination of Noah. As a church, we have to have that kind of determination. And we're going to keep that message of the gospel being shared and being taught to people time and time out. All over our country, all over our city. We're going to keep sharing that good news because that's what changes the hearts of men. And it's all about a heart problem. But not only that determination, but the distress of life. I don't ever want us to lose the distress That when we see sickening things in our society, it ought to burden our hearts and it ought to bother our hearts. Don't lose that. But also, the deliverance of God through the story of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God delivers me and you when we put our faith in Him. I don't care how bad our culture gets. When we're faithful to God, God will deliver. He may have to destroy the ungodliness around us, but He will deliver the godly. We will have the victory. We have no fear about what's happening. We just have sorrow because people aren't getting on board with God. But our message stays the same. Our hope is secure. Jesus is our anchor. Our message keeps going out to change the lives of people. So we're going to leave here with that determination of Noah. We're leaving here with, even though we're distressed by sin, we know the deliverance is available. It will take place for us and it can take place for others that we share the good news with. Faithful to the finish. Which side are you on? If you've never turned away from your own sin, I'm begging you today. Turn. Repent. Put Jesus on as the Lord of your life. Be baptized into Christ and start life all over brand new. Just like a couple did earlier before service. Brand new. If you let your faith kind of gotten old or lukewarm. Maybe it's time to say, you know what? I need a renewed commitment to be faithful to the finish. And we're here for you for that. But if, as a church family, if we don't hold ourselves 
to our commitments. And if we don't keep on preaching that news that changes life, we'll, we'll lose our own way. And I'm not willing for that to happen. God desires to use you to change the world as you live for him. And I don't want you to walk out of here without making that decision to live for him forever. So if you ever need to respond to that, you can do so while together we stand and we sing.